Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Kevin Miller. Uh, I'm uh, one of the engineering managers within uh, EC2, specifically in some of our networking area. Uh, and I've been with uh, Amazon now for about seven years, so I can talk about uh, kind of things that have happened over a long duration. Uh, but today, in particular, this morning, uh, I want to talk a little bit about network performance. Uh, and this is a 400-level talk. This is we're going to deep dive on TCP performance and, and really get into some of the, the underlying nitty-gritty that happens within TCP. Uh, and, and so the first, uh, you know, the first couple sections will really focus on you know, what is TCP, how, how does it work, what are some of the underlying um, parameters and inputs that TCP uses to, to control how fast data is sent on the network, which obviously I'm, I'm sure most of you really do care about uh, when you're in the cloud and, and you're trying to send data back and forth or, or you know, access a database or deliver content to end customers. Uh, obviously, network performance matters a great deal. So, so we're going to spend a couple, the first couple sections really focus on that. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about uh, some, some uh, applications of this and some, some uh, samples I put together, some situations I put together to really test uh, how we could tune TCP on Linux to obtain higher levels of network performance. And so as a little bit of a, uh, of a teaser, uh, in, in one of these applications later, you'll see actually we found a way to increase network performance 137%, just with some simple tweaks that we did that I did to uh, the Linux settings on the server. So uh, there is, it is possible to really uh, impact TCP meaningfully with just some simple tweaks and really understanding how your application works or, and, and what you need out of the network. And so that's really the focus of today's talk. Again, we're going to dive super deep, so, so hang tight. All right, so first off, yes, uh, I, you know, I've been at Amazon for seven years. I love the cloud. But uh, more than that, I'm a network guy. I really love TCP. So this is going to be, uh, let's, let's, let's dive deep into TCP. You know, just to get started, uh, TCP is a transmission control protocol. I'm sure lots of you can uh, you know, sort of name off the, the, the usual sort of three-way handshake about TCP. Most people know that TCP has a three-way handshake. Uh, but there's a lot more that's going on under, under the hood. Uh, and, and, you know, but hopefully most of you, or many of you may recognize, TCP really does underlie almost all of the, the protocols that we use to deliver application data. So whether that's you know, management through SSH, uh, delivering content through HTTP or HTTPS, uh, accessing a database server from an application server, sending email, you know, you name it. There's, there's only a few protocols really in widespread use that, that don't use TCP. Uh, and, and one of the primary reasons for that is because TCP does provide stream-based delivery of content. So, you know, TCP is responsible for uh, maintaining in-order delivery of your, your messages, making sure your, your messages on your network sockets are delivered in the same order that they're sent. Uh, it also performs flow control to try to speed up or slow down a connection based on what it's perceiving in the network in terms of congestion. So, you know, a lot of the internet uses TCP, uh, and, and the, the mechanisms here are obviously have pretty widespread applicability. All right, so throughout today, we're going to be talking primarily about just some, you know, very simple test bed, and, and, and you know, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, I spun up in, in, a, in just, you know, in a few minutes with, with EC2, something that you can obviously spin up as well. Uh, so we're going to have Jack and Jill. And let's say that Jack and Jill want to uh, connect with each other. They want to have a TCP connection between them and, and exchange some data for, for whatever purpose. Now, the first thing to realize with, with TCP is that uh, although we, we often commonly talk about a connection between Jack, you know, two, two, in, two instances or two servers uh, or a client and server, we often talk about it as a connection. Uh, you know, really, we, when we are digging the next level deep, we really want to be thinking about the fact that it is a pair of unidirectional uh, connections. So Jack may want to send some data to Jill. Jill may want to send some data back to Jack on, on the same connection. But when you think about when we look at all the TCP parameters and, and the mechanisms involved there, uh, we really should separate out the, the, set, you know, the, 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 the path in one direction from the path back in the opposite direction, because they can operate uh, independently. All right, so we're going to be talking about several of the aspects of, of TCP. Uh, and uh, one thing, sort of the next, the next level of detail, the next level that we're going to dig into is how does TCP control uh, you, how much data is in flight at any one time? And as you'll see in a moment, you know, the amount of data you have in flight at one time between Jack and Jill or Jill and Jack, uh, that has a direct correlation to your bandwidth, to how much throughput you actually do perceive in the end. 
So you know, typically, we, we often get the final number. We see, oh, this connection you know, was, uh, you know, was operating at 100 megabits per second or was operating at 20 megabits per second. Uh, but but the, the sort of the inputs, the next level of inputs to that are basically the amount of data that is being sent at any one time or is in flight between these two machines. And there's, there's really two ways that TCP controls that, or two, two inputs to control that amount of data. And, and those are the receive window and the congestion window. So uh, the receive window is essentially what Jack is signaling to Jill to say, this is how much data you can send me at one time before I send you an acknowledgment. Uh, because as, as Jill is sending data to Jack, uh, Jack needs to uh, queue that data and deliver it to an application. And so that TCP stack is, is signaling back to Jill saying, you know, you can send me this amount of data before you get an acknowledgment back for me, uh, and that'll make sure that I don't overrun my buffers on, on Jack's side. So that's one of the two mechanisms that's used to control the amount of data in flight. The second is this congestion window. And the congestion window is managed on the sender side. So Jill is, as Jill is sending data to Jack, uh, the TCP stack on Jill is watching what's happening on that connection. You know, specifically it's watching, you know, am I seeing uh, timeouts, am I, am I perceiving loss? Uh, and adjusting the amount of data it's willing, in this case, Jill is willing to put on the network uh, until an acknowledgment comes back from Jack. So these are two mechanisms that are really operating in parallel, and you are, as Jill is sending, uh, then Jill is responsible for making sure that both the receive window and the congestion window uh, are being um, uh, adhered to. And then I mentioned as well, you know, bandwidth is really is a function of how much data is in flight. It's also a function of the round trip time between Jack and Jill, and we'll dig into that a little bit more here in a, in a moment. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, here's an example uh, you know, of that. So the, the term for this is the bandwidth delay product, right? And that is essentially um, how much data is in flight uh, and, and what is the round trip time. So I have an example here. Again, Jill is sending data to Jack. And let's say they have a two millisecond round trip time. You know, this would be, for example, if I was operating in the same availability zone or, or, you know, or even within the same region, I may see up to about, you know, I may, I may see about a two millisecond round trip time, sometimes a little bit more, but, but you know, that's fairly typical. And so if Jack has a 100 kilobyte receive window and I have a two millisecond round trip time, you can do the math fairly easily. It's, it's, it's shown here, it's worked out, that you basically convert that and you can see that that works out to a maximum throughput of 400 megabits per second. And that is, so again, that is simply a function of how big is the receive window on Jack and what is the round trip time between Jack and Jill. And the reason we use the round trip time is because, again, Jill is not going to send another piece of data until an acknowledgment comes back. So from the time Jill sends a piece of data, that has to go to Jack, and then Jack will send the acknowledgment back to Jill, and that's what then triggers Jill to say, okay, I'll send some more data. So we look at the round trip time as, the, as one of the inputs to this function. All right, so that's one example. Um, 400 megabits per second sounds pretty good if I'm trying to transfer a fair bit of data. You know, 400 megabits per second is, is okay. It's not bad. We could do better, but, you know, it, it'll suffice. But let's say that Jack and Jill are actually separated by a much larger distance. You know, let's say they're going across country uh, where we might see up to 100 millisecond round trip time. Across the United States, uh, depending on where you're going, 100 milliseconds might be your round trip time. Well. Uh, now you're talking about a much different uh, output. You're talking about a, a maximum potential throughput of around 8 megabits per second. And so you can see that Jack's receive window, the amount of data Jack is willing to send at any one time, or receive rather, at any one time, has a, has a huge impact on, on the, the peak uh, throughput that we could obtain. So we'll, we'll look into this in a little more detail. So again, the receive window is controlled by the uh, uh, by the receiver, and then the receiver has to signal that to the sender. And throughout the day, I'm going to show you plenty of examples. These are all on Linux, uh, and typically I've done these all on the, the you know, I've, many of these are long-standing um, tweaks you can do on many versions of Linux, but in, in general, I've been looking at these recently on the most recent Amazon Linux uh, AMI. So, uh, but if I want to interrogate the kernel to see, you know, what is the maximum size of the receive window, I can look at this, this first sysctl, and you can see here that it's saying the maximum it will 
ha uh, allow is 11 megabytes. You know, and that, this is the analogous to that 100 kilobyte buffer that I mentioned on the previous slide. So this is obviously quite, you know, this is fairly generous. Uh, again, uh, it's fairly generous, uh, particularly if I have a, a very low latency connection. But again, the, the longer your, the, the larger the latency, the larger the round trip time to between your your two machines, um, the, the larger you need to make this to inc you know to get to increase your your maximum possible TCP performance. So that's the first uh, command. The second command is specifically for TCP, and it's a little bit more complicated because in, in Linux it has three settings that are all sort of combined together into one sysctl. And that is essentially what is the minimum, the default, and the maximum uh, buffer size that, that will be allocated. And Linux then will automatically manage the buffer sizes for you, you know, based on, 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 on other inputs and, and other uh, algorithms. But, but essentially here we're saying, I think the, probably the most interesting thing to look at here is the default, which is to say we, we will by default in this case allocate a half megabyte buffer, uh, 524, 288 bytes uh, for my receive window. And so again, um, if, uh, whoops. So, so again, if I, if I wanted to uh, increase my performance uh, for particularly for a, a high latency, a high round trip time connection, these would be some sysctls that we could change. Uh, to, to increase the, the receive window. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the receive window, and now we're gonna shift focus and talk a little bit about the congestion window. Uh, because again, there's, you know, the, both windows uh, are, uh, have a, both windows need to be respected as we're sending data across a TCP connection. So it, you know, even if we've adjusted the receive window, uh, to give ourselves more room to receive data, uh, we might be facing, uh, you know, if we're looking at a, a performance bottleneck where we want to increase TCP performance, uh, we need to make sure that we do so in the congestion window as well. So the, the congestion window is, is one of these things that's a little bit of, uh, a little bit of magic, uh, and we'll, we'll go through that, but it's controlled by the sender and is, you know, is managed by uh, the, the congestion control algorithm. This is the TCP congestion control algorithm. And this is where we get some of the magic um, in TCP. So the key inputs to the congestion uh, window typically, it does vary by algorithm, but the two key inputs tend to be loss. You know, that is uh, the uh, sender's perception of packets that are lost between the sender and the receiver. And, and latency, what is the, you know, the, the round trip time basically, how long does it take for a packet to get to the destination and then an acknowledgement to come back. And, and some protocols actually do have other inputs I should note, but I, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail today. The other input that you sometimes see is uh, explicit signaling. There are protocols to do explicit signaling of congestion or um, uh, or, or congestion or, or other or loss, and those can be explicitly signaled back to the sender. But uh, for today's purposes, we're going to focus really on, on loss and latency. So when um, uh, when when a TCP connection is first established, uh, the congestion window is not yet under con complete control of the congestion control algorithm uh, because the algorithm doesn't have the, the inputs, you know, the, the loss or the latency data necessarily to make a decision about how fast or slow should I go, how big should my congestion window be. So one of the settings that actually does have some potentially in, you know, meaningful impact on your application is the initial congestion window. And that is basically the default initial uh, size, the amount of data that, uh, we, that the, the TCP will allow to be put on the network uh, before it starts to get the inputs back about data being successfully sent or received, uh, successfully received specifically. So in, in Linux, the default, you know, the, the way you see this, um, the initial congestion window, is actually by using the, looking at the routes. The reason for that is that you can actually set this on a per route basis. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Uh, and so you look at the route table, and you don't see anything here that really calls out as an initial congestion window. And again, that's because it's just defaulted. And so the default in Linux is three, uh, three frames, uh, or three, three packets, which uh, for you know, a, a 15, if you have a 1500 byte maximum transmission unit, uh, which you know, connections to the internet typically do, uh, that's gonna work out to about 4300 bytes. And that means that in the, in the immediate moment after a TCP, is connection, a TCP connection is established, TCP is not gonna put more than 4300 bytes onto the wire until it starts to get acknowledgements back. You know, which, which again, could be fairly meaningful. We'll talk about how that really has impact in a little bit. So um, some, you know, if you, if you look around, some people 
uh, recommend increasing this window size. Um, again, particularly if you have a, you know, a, a particularly if you have a, a small amount of data that if you're, if, if you have a lot of TCP connections that are very short lived and exchange a small amount of data uh, and, and your round trip time can be high, uh, you, you can actually see some pretty meaningful impact as I'll, as I'll show later by increasing your initial congestion window. And again, all this is doing is telling TCP that in that very first moment after a connection is established, I want you to put more data on the wire, uh, waiting, you know, and then wait for the acknowledgments to come back. So here I show an example of how I can update a route and say, I'd like to increase the initial congestion window from three up to 16 uh, packets. And that gets me, instead of that 4,300 bytes in that initial congestion window, I'm now increasing that to 23, 23K. So imagine if you have a, uh, you know, application that's doing some heart beating or something where the response payload is less than 23K, you know, now suddenly you've changed this from being, you know, so let's say, let's assume that it's between 4K and 23K. Now what you've done is you've, you've potentially eliminated, uh, you know, one, one half of a round trip uh, of, of latency uh, to, to, to deliver your uh, result on this, on this socket. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the initial congestion window. Now I want to focus a little bit on, on loss. You know, again, loss is one of these inputs to congestion. And you know, this, is a, this, is a, uh, this chart is the result of some experiments I did. And you know, it's, it's, I actually did this a few years ago. And it's one of these things that is, has had a big impression on me because previously I had, had sort of thought, well, you know, if you, you know, 1 percent loss, it doesn't sound so bad, or 2 percent loss, it doesn't necessarily sound so bad, but if you actually measure the impact on TCP throughput, um, loss has a hugely impactful, uh, uh, has a huge impact on TCP throughput, and again, this is just sort of doing a normal, you know, normalized to 100. If I, if I have a zero loss connection, you know, that's normalized to 100. What does my throughput look like as I increase the loss rate? And you can see that by the time you get to five or six percent, you, you are basically dead in the water. I mean, this is, you know, you, you, the amount of data that, the amount of throughput you can get through TCP, once you get to five percent or six percent error rate, is just way, way lower than what you can get at, at a, you know, completely clean zero percent loss. So again, loss has a, you know, this, and, and all of this really is because loss is one of these inputs to the congestion control algorithm, and then as it detects loss, it's going to, it's going to pull the, it's going to close that window, it's going to keep that window low uh, to try to avoid uh, creating more congestion in the network. And so, you know, again, it has a fairly significant, huge impact on, on your TCP throughput. And, and essentially, the takeaway for me is, if you're having, you know, if I'm having a, TCP throughput issue, a network performance issue, um, you know, I can look at the receive window. We talked about that earlier. But one of the first leading suspects is, you know, are we sensing loss on this path? So if I want to start investigating this, let's say I'm, I have that complaint. I'm being told, hey, you know, my, my performance is bad. I'm, I'm seeing queuing. I might be seeing data. You know, I'm trying to transfer data, and it's just not transferring very quickly, uh, or it's potentially it's, you know, I have data backing up. Um, how do I investigate this? Well, the first thing you can do on, on Linux, and, and there's a rough equivalent on Windows as well, for that matter, uh, you can use Netstat. And you can just, uh, Netstat-S, you can look for the retransmission counters. And these are, these are OS-wide counters. So it's pretty coarse, coarse data. You don't necessarily have, um, uh, this, this doesn't necessarily help identify exactly what's going on or where it's going on, but it does give you some clue that something's going awry. You're, you're seeing retransmissions, and retransmissions are, are done typically in response to sensed loss. So, so if, if you see a retransmission, TCP thinks there's loss somewhere. And now again, keep in mind, these are counters that are, that are initialized to zero when your instance is booted. So uh, you know, 58,000 might seem high, but it, it might, that might have been two weeks ago. And, and right now, you might not be seeing it. So you know, typically, what I would do with this is just watch this over a few seconds or a few minutes and see, you know, are my counters increasing right now? Am I sensing loss right now? But we can do better. We can actually dig a little bit deeper than just at the, the macro OS level. And to do that, there's a command uh, in, in Linux uh, installed by default, uh, typically. And, and certainly, it's available in the Amazon Linux AMI, uh, the SS command. Uh, and, and what SS does is actually gives you a, the next level of detail. It really shows you on a per connection basis uh, what are you seeing right now. You know, essentially, this is giving you a nice 
bit of visibility into the TCP um, algorithm, the congestion control algorithm in the state machine to really see what's going on with the socket. Now, the downside is you have to, you have to watch this in real time. This is, you know, with NetStat, you can get a historical view of, of what's going on. With SS, you're going to see, what am I seeing right this very moment? But certainly, if you're actively troubleshooting something, it's a great way to, to really get some insight into what's going on. So, uh, you know, I, I won't necessarily call out every little bit in here. Uh, that's, you, you know, that can be, you can look that up. But, you know, a few things I will call out. Uh, first off, in the upper left, you see the, the TCP state. And that just tells you what is the, the TCP stack think the state of this connection is right now. In this case, it's established. So that's good. That means we can send data back and forth. Um, we see the send queue. So we see that actually the application, whatever this, um, this is, you know, you can see actually in the next uh, bit, you can see that this is an HTTPS port locally. So, you know, it's a, presumably this is my web server. Uh, my web server has written some data into my kernel, into my TCP socket, uh, and it's queued for transmission. At this moment, I actually have, you know, almost four megabytes ready to be transmitted, just sitting there waiting for the acknowledgments to come back. I can see that the word cubic here, we're going to dig in a into this a little bit later, but cubic is actually the name of the TCP congestion control algorithm that we're using on this socket. And cubic is the default in Linux at this point. So this basically means I'm using the default TCP congestion control algorithm. Um, but I'm going to show you later how we can actually tweak this. RTO stands for retransmission timeout. And so what that means is this is uh, measured in milliseconds. And so uh, what this indicates is that this, for this socket, the congestion control algorithm is going to wait up to 204 milliseconds at this moment. Uh, it's going to wait up to 204 milliseconds after a packet is transmitted before it considers it to have been lost and will then initiate a retransmission. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about that actually in, in a few more slides. But again, this is measured in milliseconds. And then CWND stands for congestion window. And so just like we talked about earlier, we talked about the size of the congestion window. Here I can see that my congestion window is 138 bytes long. Um, and so you can then do the math actually on the, the MSS is actually the, oops, is actually the previous uh, field. So you can do the math to figure out uh, basically the size, the total byte size of your congestion window as we, as we talked about earlier. All right, and then finally, you know, again, there's lots of stuff here you can dig into more detail, but uh, finally we'll look at the retransmission counter and see that we have seen some retransmissions on this socket. So again, this is an indication that TCP has previously seen uh, loss on this socket and it's initiated, it's, it's retransmitted data to, to accom accommodate that loss, to account for that loss. All right. And then the next level of detail. So, so you know, with SS, you, again, you can get a bunch of, of really, really helpful information to see what's going on with my, my TCP state right now. Um, there's a tool that I actually have the URL to this tool here. It's um, Brendan Gregg is you know, one of the uh, uh, engineers at, at Netflix, actually. And uh, he has some, some pretty nice performance diagnostic tools. One of them, sorry, these tools in general all use um, the Linux kernel tracing capabilities. Uh, to get more insight as far as what's going on with my network right now. And so he has a, there's a tool in his tool bag called TCP Retrans. And what this does is simply uh, monitors the, it, what it actually does is hooks into the, literally the kernel function that controls retransmissions. And it's essentially just watching for initiations, you know, for, for hits on that function. So this will actually give you essentially a real-time view of which sockets are seeing retransmissions, uh, you know, in, again, in, in near real time. So in this case, you know, as I, I, I ran this, it'll just sit there, and as you're sending data back and forth, it will, you know, print out when it sees a retransmission event. Um, so this can be a super valuable way to just watch in, in real time what sockets are seeing retransmissions, aka loss, you know, at this, at this time. Um, and again, when, you, when, you, when it sees that, it gives you a little bit of metadata. It tells you the source port and destination port. That's, you know, that's, so you get the, the local address. Whoops, wrong button there. So you get the local address. You get the port number. You know, obviously, 443 would be HTTPS. Uh, of course, and then you get the remote address, the remote port number, and the state of the um, socket. And um, the, 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 this method or this uh, tool tries to correlate the socket back to a particular process ID running on your machine. So you can see it's showing this process ID 10655 or 588, 
And so this is giving me an indication that, you know, this, that, that process ID owns this socket uh, and, and is seeing a retransmission right now. Okay, so super valuable. This is giving me nice, you know, good data to figure out where am I seeing a retransmission at this moment. Uh, so we're going to talk, you know, now we're going to talk about, you know, what can we do about it? How can we re respond to loss or, or retransmissions? And so I mentioned earlier that, you know, the congestion control algorithm is a little bit of the, uh, the magic that goes on here. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go, I, I could probably have a, a, you know, a, a multi-hour talk on congestion control algorithms and, and the details here. There's, there's a lot of complex math that goes into these algorithms, which, you know, I encourage you to, to look up if you're really, if you're interested. Um, but, you know, what we need to, for our purposes, you know, what I, what I want to do as a systems engineer is be able to, to, to tweak my congestion control algorithms to increase my performance. That's, that's ultimately my goal. So, so let's, let's do enough to, to do that. Well, you know, a little bit of history. It, the congestion control algorithm in Linux uh, before the 268 kernel was what's, what was known as new Reno. These, these, these algorithms all have various names. Um, there's one named Vegas. You'll see that. I, you know, I don't know. I guess it was designed maybe uh, in a casino. I don't know. Um, but before 268, uh, you know, New Reno was the default. Uh, in 268, it was changed to a protocol called BIC. And then most recently, you know, it, or, or after 2619, it was changed to Cubic, uh, which remains the default algorithm that we see in, in Amazon Linux uh, and other Linux uh, kernels today. But, but the cool thing here is that Linux has a pretty pluggable architecture for the, the algorithm. And in fact, every single socket um, can have a different algorithm. You can use different algorithms on different sockets um, if, if you desire. So there's, there's a variety of, of algorithms that are, that are typically available. And, and again, if you use Amazon Linux, these are all available by default. No code compilation required. You can actually turn these on. Uh, there's a variety of other protocols, you know, Vegas, Illinois, Westwood, High Speed, Scalable, uh, and, and others. So how do I actually do that? Well, because you're, you're going to see later, actually, I, I, I did this and, and, in fact, found some pretty amazing results by, able, by tweaking my, my algorithm. Um, so to figure out what you have currently loaded in the kernel and available, uh, you can use the, the TOPSYS CTL. And that's just interrogating the kernel to say what congestion control algorithms are, are currently loaded. Um, if you want to find all of the ones that you can load, the second command just looks at your, literally just looks at your kernel module directories to see what's there uh, and looks for the TCP uh, prefix, uh, which, which will indicate that it's a TCP congestion algorithm. And um, in this case, I've decided I want to try out the TCP, the, the Illinois algorithm. Uh, and, and the reason I've, I've chosen this one in particular is that I've done a little bit of, of, of research and reading and, and identified that uh, the Illinois algorithm is one that was, was actually designed to uh, respond more favorably to loss, to, to, um, to react uh, a little bit differently uh, and potentially better in, in cases where we're seeing uh, a low level of packet loss. So I've gone ahead and, and used the you know, kernel, uh, the mod probe command just to load up my Illinois uh, module. And now if I re-query the kernel, you can see that it's telling me that, hey, now I have all three of these algorithms available for my use um, in the kernel. All right, so now what, I've, what I want to do, you know, I, again, I indicated that every, every single socket can use a different algorithm if you so choose. Um, but, but typically, I, you know, I, I haven't done a ton of research, but I haven't come across too many pieces of software or web servers or, or what have you that, that give me this ability to control it. Because the, the, way, that, the way that it would be controlled is by the, the software uh, uh, signaling as such, like doing the, the right system call to, to change the algorithm. And so you know, I haven't found much software that, that can, allows me to do this. Um, so what I'm going to do for my test today is I'm, I'm just going to override it system-wide. I'm just going to tell my Linux uh, system I want all new connections uh, by default to be established using the Illinois algorithm. And I do that with the first command. And, and now, now that's set. Every single new connection that comes through, unless it's overridden, um, again, which most software does not, unless it's overridden, it'll, it'll go ahead and use Illinois. And then if I really want to force Illinois to be used uh, permanently on my system, I do need to uh, write it to disk so that it gets uh, set when the, the kernel reboots. But you know, the first command changes it in memory for, for my current uh, uh, run of the, of the operating system. And then I can write it to disk to, to be permanent. 
All right, so we're gonna see some results from that in a little bit, but I have a few other things we wanna to touch on before we get to the results. Um, a little bit earlier I talked about the retransmission timer, that's the RTO value. And so, you know, the, the retransmission timer also plays a pretty critical role, you know, when you think about latency of your application, uh, because what this does is it controls when the, the algorithm considers that a packet has been lost. And so, the, you know, you, th this is actually a little bit tricky to get set. I mean, again, TCP manages this dynamically for you, and, and in most cases, does a fairly good job, but again, depending on your network application, may, may not be the, the right setting for you. And so the retransmission timer, if, if it gets too low, you know, can lead to, uh, can lead to a little bit, you know, could lead to a packet that's delayed just a little bit too long and triggering a retransmission and also triggering the algorithm to really close down and slow down, you know, close the congestion window and really slow your connection down. So if it's too low, you know, you run into the danger that that happens. But if it gets too high, then you can be essentially waiting around, waiting for that timer to run out if you actually experience loss of a packet. So imagine that you have a retransmission timer that's one second and you are um, you know, sending to something that's 10 milliseconds away and you experience loss. Well, that loss will happen within that first 10 milliseconds and then you're waiting another you know, 990 milliseconds for that timer to fire before you just do that one retransmission and you know, that might get your packet through and, and you'd be on your way. So if, you, you know, if, if the timer gets too high, that can really increase the latency for your, for your socket as well, you know, when, when you see loss. Now in Linux, you know, just like we saw earlier with the initial congestion window, you can set the default minimum uh, retransmission timer on your sockets. The default, in, uh, or you can set the minimum rather. The default is 200 milliseconds, and it's set on the route level, just like the congestion window. Um, so if you, if you look at your route list, you won't see anything for the default. Um, but, you know, but, but if I, if I want to change it uh, on my route list, I, I look at my routes and, and this is, you know, this is a default, this is my a default set of routes that I would see, you know, running my instance in, in virtual private cloud and the 10.16.16 route is, is a local route to other things in the, in the same subnet that I'm in. So, you know, I could set this as, I could change that timer for my my local, for, for the route, for the, you know, the, the local subnet route, I could change it for my default route, or I could add a route if I wanted to have a different timer on a specific set of destinations. And so one of the things I'm gonna do here is I'm actually just gonna go ahead and change my, my uh, minimum retransmission timer um, just for my local subnet route, because I know that you know, my local subnet route, it's in the same availability zone, and if I see loss, then I'm, I'm, I'm almost surely gonna see that within 10 milliseconds. Um, so having a 200 millisecond uh, timer you know, may simply cause me to wait an extra you know, 190 milliseconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and change it using the route command. I'm gonna add an RTO min of 10 milliseconds on my route. And then if I re-query the route, you'll see that then that, is, that shows up in the route output. So I can confirm it's set. All right, so a few other topics and then we're gonna to get to some of the applications. Um, another thing that, that researchers have identified that can potentially be problematic for, for TCP connections is you know, essentially the, the, the queuing that might happen along the intermediate network path between these two hosts. And so when you, when you look at you know, particularly longer paths when you have multiple routers or, or network devices between uh, two hosts, um, typically those devices are built to have uh, interface buffers. You know, essentially data comes in uh, one side and then will be routed and stored in an interface buffer, an output buffer, just waiting for available time on the, the port to transmit. You know, now obviously if the port has time right now, that'll just be transmitted out, you'll be done. <clears throat> but as the load increases on, a, on an individual port, you know, that can lead to that buffer increasing in length, the queue length increasing, and that is really where you then start to see latency. That's what introduces latency on your, on your path. And again, the, 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 the problem here can be that a little bit of latency, if, if particularly, you know, even if you just have two computers, you just have Jack and Jill sending data, let's say that Jill has a bunch of data to send and just starts dumping that data on the network in, in one shot as fast as Jill possibly can, you know, that could lead to some intermediate port buffer uh, filling or, or, or certainly being longer, you know, getting longer 
uh, which then increases latency for those individual packets. And then that might actually end up triggering, it could end up triggering a retransmission timeout. And so there's, um, there's a whole body of research around this, but it, the, the, the team actually, the, the folks that are doing, doing some research here have actually done a pretty nice job of trying to simplify this down to a set of, uh, or, or a simple algorithm that you can apply, again, in Linux. This is actually available to you out of the box in Linux. Um, you can turn this on. It's called the Coddle algorithm. And what, it, what this does is actually uh, paces the rate that packets are put onto the network to try to avoid creating these intermediate uh, buffers, uh, cr creating, you know, el elongating the intermediate buffers along the path from two, two machines. And so you'll see that this is, this command, the first command is actually just to list what is my current um, configuration for, for what Linux calls traffic control. That is basically how it manages its outgoing queues coming off of the box. And so I can just list, and, and this is really the default you'll see, this top one. And then if I want to activate this coddle algorithm, it's, it's literally just one command, uh, this, this last command you see, and that turns on this coddle algorithm to try to pace how quickly uh, packets are written to the network. And this whole, sort of, this whole sort of space is called active queue management, and, and this is something that um, uh, we'll see in a, in a moment actually does improve network performance in some cases. All right, a few other, a few other things I want to cover before we get to some of the applications. So, uh, you know, most of my tests, as I've explained, I've run, been running these tests in uh, EC2, in Amazon EC2. Um, I, I ran all of these tests on a pretty modern machine that had uh, enhanced networking configured. If you're not familiar with enhanced networking, I strongly recommend looking at one of, uh, I, I, there was a, a talk last year at reInvent, uh, this SDD419 talk, that really deep dove on, on enhanced networking. Uh, there's lots of documentation online as well, but enhanced networking really is, a, 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 in, in almost every case, or in, in every case I've seen, enhanced networking is an improvement. Uh, it reduces the, the CPU utilization of your instance, uh, reduces latency and jitter, uh, and gives you overall higher packet rate performance. And we have, we have enhanced networking available on um, all of our modern uh, instance families, as you can see here. The drivers, it does require special drivers to activate. Those drivers have been baked into Amazon Linux and Windows for a while. So it, really, using enhanced networking now is as simple as launching the right uh, AMIs on modern instance types. Uh, but if you're not, uh, if you have any questions about this, I, I definitely recommend taking a look at, at one of the uh, past talks. Um, another thing to note is that more, more, the modern instance types in, in EC2 also have increased the maximum transmission unit. Um, so for those of you who are not, aren't familiar with this, uh, this concept, you know, historically on, on the internet we've seen a 1500 byte MTU as kind of the, the, the standard default, uh, which you know, if you look at how much uh, data is available for TCP, that ends up being 1448 bytes. So you end up with about a 3.5% overhead on every single packet for all the headers. Uh, on, on your MT, you know, on your on your frames, but with um, with with enhanced networking and some of the modern instance types, we've we've pushed up the the MTU to 9,001 bytes, and that obviously just because that gives you more payload with no additional headers required, that does actually reduce the amount of overhead you have, and so that can be an improvement as well um, as we'll see. The, again, the good news here is in VPC. Um, with with uh, modern instance types, uh, this is just done by default for you. The 9,000 byte, uh, 9,001 byte MTU is just done by default. There's really nothing to think about, but it's worth just understanding what's going on there. If I want to confirm this, I can actually just use the IP link list command, and I'll just confirm what my MTU is. So in this case, I've looked and I've confirmed that I have uh, a 9,001 byte MTU. You can um, you can tune this on an individual route level if you like. And again, this isn't really required. Um, the, the, the MTU will be signaled automatically to you. Uh, if you're sending data out to the internet, you will have to still use a 1500 byte MTU, but, but that will be signaled uh, when, when you try to uh, initiate a connection to the internet. Um, but if you wanted to override it, if you wanted to force it yourself, you can actually do that, again, through the IP route command, just for completeness sake, because I am going to be tuning this myself a little bit, and this just shows how you can tune that. All right, so at long last, you know, I've, I've, I've been uh, uh, highlighting this for the entire talk. I want to apply some of our new knowledge and just see how we can take everything we've just talked about, which is, I know, a ton of content and, and very dense, and we can apply it to actually achieving some, some improvements in you know, some, some applications that we might have on the network. 
So just for background, this is a little bit of science here, so I want to be really clear about how I've, I've done this. If you want to replicate this or try it out yourself, you know, I, I strongly encourage you, um, if, if you're concerned about network performance, I, I encourage you to set up a test bed and really experiment with this so you, you understand how the network is going to perform with your application. Um, so what I did, I did was I just had a pair of instances. Uh, I'm running you know, the most recent Amazon Linux AMI. And for my tests, I'm just using uh, Nginx as a web server, and I'm using the Apache Bench tool as my client. Apache Bench is a pretty simple tool that can concurrently pull uh, several uh, uh, requests and, and, and repeat requests. Um, I actually did this entirely, um, well, I have, I have four applications. Three of them I did with, with HTTPS, and I'll explain the fourth in a minute. But you know, my, my, my theory here is that increasingly everything needs to be encrypted. That, that is a meaningful part of our network connections. We need to make sure that we can not just transmit data, but we can do so securely with, with things like TLS. So I'm using you know, TLS v1 with some modern ciphers. Uh, and for purposes of my tests, I'm just doing random data. I'm transferring random data. And I'm ensuring that I'm not hitting any other disk I.O. I, I really wanted for this test, I really want to just isolate the network. And so I'm, I'm even using a RAMFS. So, the, so all of the data that's being transmitted is coming straight out of memory. I'm guaranteeing it's coming out of memory. And then once I'm receiving it, I'm not trying to write it. I'm just throwing it away as I get it. So really just to try to isolate the network performance so that I can, I can be clear what's going on. So if you, if you do run Apache Bench, you'll see it, it, it gives you some output. Um, this, is the, this is just a snippet of the output. There's, there's much more here as well. But you know, this gives you some basic metrics about your, your transmission, how many requests were completed, um, your, your average time per request, and your transfer rate. So this is the kind of output that I, I was then using to generate all the metrics you're going to see here in a moment. All right, so my first application that I really wanted to test was, you know, I, I want to see an example where there's a little bit of loss. You know, we saw earlier the, the huge impact that loss can have on your TCP performance. Uh, and you know, certainly AWS engineers our networks to have you know, very, very low loss uh, and very tight tolerances on, on the amount of loss that we, uh, that we, we, are, we allow and, and we monitor very, that very carefully. But if I'm going out on the internet, I'm, you know, if I have mobile clients or I have clients that might be in a remote geography, I, I really want to make sure that my, my application does well, even with a little bit of loss. So for this test, I'm basically simulating 0.2% loss, you know, which again, doesn't sound very much, but just wait. So again, I have a pair of instances. I'm doing this across an, you know, a path that has around an 80 millisecond round trip time. And I'm, I'm setting up this test to just uh, parallel pull a 100 megabyte object you know, a few times. And again, in Linux, um, I, I'm actually simulating the loss here um, just to make sure that I, I'm really getting my 0.2% loss that I want. Uh, and Linux actually makes this super easy. If you want to run this experiment and simulate some loss and see what happens, it's, it's literally one command and you can do that. And so my goal here, what I'm trying to achieve is I want to, I want to see what happens in a clean network and then I want to add my loss and I want to try to get my performance back up as close to that clean network performance as I can, uh, because you know again, 0.2% loss is pretty minimal. But um, I, I do expect that it, you know if I'm serving mobile customers or going to a remote geography, this might just be a fact of life that I need to live with. All right. So what are my results? Well, I, I started by doing you know no loss, just all defaults, out of the box, no tweaking. What am I getting? And with this test, I was achieving around four gigabits per second. And the mean request time was you know, around 28 seconds. So pretty good. Then I introduced my loss, and boom, 1.5 gigabits. 0.2% loss is all it took. Now I'm seeing you know, um, less than half the performance, and it is more than twice as long uh, mean to, to obtain this, you know, for this for the requests. So clearly, loss has a pretty big impact. So I started experimenting. Let's, uh, I, I, was, I, I started playing with these, and I, started, I, I sort of hypothesized what the problem might be, um, played around with some settings to see if it would improve or, or not. I, you know, the, one of the first things I tried was I'm just going to increase my initial congestion window. I'm going to try to get more data in the, in the uh, transmitted earlier, maybe prime that congestion window to be a little bit higher. Uh, turns out I was wrong. <laughs> uh, it, it made my performance worse, 1.3 gigabits per second and now an 81 second mean time. So I got rid of that. I scratched that off. And I, then I went to another approach. I, I decided, well, what if I were to just double my, my buffers on the server side? 
You know, and I, and I will say, in this test in general, I was trying to do things mostly on the server side, on the theory that, you know, it's way easier for me to tweak something on the server side than go tell a bunch of clients to, to make a change on, on their infrastructure. So, so I tried to do as much as I can on the server. In this case, you know, I tried to increase my TCP um, buffers just to see if, you know, if, if making more data available to the, to, to the TCP would, would help. And again, the, no, didn't, doesn't help. Ended up being a little bit worse than my, my, my default with just some loss. So now, this, this was a real interesting insight, I, or uh, experiment. I, I hypothesized that maybe if I use this Illinois congestion control algorithm, which uh, speaks to being able to work around some loss uh, it, more effectively, um, and maybe that would help. And, and sure enough, actually, this helped a bunch. Uh, so again, all I did was I, I swapped out the default congestion control algorithm in, in my uh, Linux OS. And um, sure enough, I got to three point, uh, nearly 3.5 gigabits per second. And my mean time was within a second, or actually 300 milliseconds of where I was before. Um, so this, this was pretty meaningful. I still have 0.2% loss, and my, my, my mean time is very similar to what it was without any loss. So that's my, that's my rabbit coming out of the hat. That was my, you know, the, the, it's, it, the, the congestion control algorithm is a little bit of magic, and, and I, I think I found a rabbit coming out of the hat in this one. So, you know, in this case, just by turning this algorithm on, using this by default, I, I increased my performance from that, that initial baseline of loss by, by 137%. All right, so, so I was pretty excited about that. That's a pretty good result. And so I wanted to try some additional applications and just see you know, what else I could do with, with other applications. So in this case, uh, this application I decided, you know, it's a pretty common use case for someone to want to just transmit a bunch of data, you know, a bulk amount of data from one host to the other and just do it as fast as possible, right? The previous one really was sort of simulating a lot of clients. Uh, this one is, is about you know, a larger data set with a fewer number of clients. So again, I reset my test. Again, in this test, zero loss. So I'm just starting with, you know, assuming the network is operating, you know, perfectly, um, uh, no loss. I know what what can I do? What can I achieve? I want to increase my throughput to to the max. So out of the box default, uh, I ended up with uh, getting about two gigabits per second uh, in this application, uh, and it took about 30 seconds to transfer. So I decided, OK, I want to go ahead and, and try to, again, I want to do as much as I can to, to manage this uh, from the server end. So I tried to increase my, my TCP buffers on the server side, ended up you know, not, doing, not doing great. I ended up going backwards. I, got, I, I reduced my performance. Then I decided, OK, this is a kind of the example where I, I might have control of both the sender and the receiver. If I'm actually uh, trying to transfer a bulk amount of data from sender to receiver, I, you know, maybe, the, on the, maybe I'll have control of the, the receiver and, and can tweak things there. So I, I went ahead and I increased the TCP buffers on the, the client side. And again, this would be increasing the receive window. And sure enough, that actually helped, uh, that helped quite a bit. I got, you know, I got an extra 300 megabits per second uh, and decreased my, my mean transmission time as well. So, you know, that's one setting that ended up, uh, you know, helping me out here. I then decided I wanted to try the active queue management. Uh, you know, I, I hypothesized that maybe my performance was being limited by, by the, you know, intermediate router buffers uh, filling up. Wanted to give active queue management a try. Now, to be clear, I tried this in isolation. So this is active queue management in isolation without the extra buffers on the client side. And, and you can see that actually, you know, that, that actually also increases performance. It actually does increase performance over the baseline, though not as much as um, doubling the TCB buffers on the client end did as well. So I've got two, two things now, two uh, changes that have both increased performance. And so then I said, okay, well, let's turn them both on. <laughs> you know, natural next step is I got two things that seem to do have a little bit of improvement. Let's turn them both on together. And sure enough, that, e that increased my performance even more. Now I'm up to 2.7 gigabits per second and 24 seconds, uh, uh, 24 and a half seconds uh, mean time using the two of these settings together. And then I decided, all right, I've had some success with this Illinois congestion control algorithm. I don't have much of a loss here, but I'm curious what it does. I turned that on as well with the client buffers and queue management, and now I'm getting, I got myself an extra 100 megabits per second as I, as I turn this on and reduce my mean time even further. So now I'm, I'm actually transmitting the same amount of data in uh, you know, six and a half seconds less than I did previously. So I, again, pulled my uh, little rabbit out of the hat. Um, 
And then finally, I decided, well, you know, I, I got all three of those turned on. Those are working pretty well. What if I now increase the TCP buffer on the server side just to give myself a little bit of extra um, capacity on the server side for transmission? And that ended up, in the, you know, one, with, with the other parameters all turned on, that ended up bumping me up just a little bit more. Um, although it actually, interestingly, it bumped up my, my bandwidth performance, but ended up my mean time actually snuck up a little bit. Uh, I think we saw a few additional outliers in this because of uh, turning on the server side buffers. But all told, uh, you know, with, with some tweaks, uh, again, none, all of this is really out of the box. I was able to, to tweak this out of the box, ended up increasing my network performance by 32%. All right, two additional applications uh, that I wanted to I want to talk about, that I wanted to test. So the next is I decided that I really wanted to test, you know, the previous, uh, the previous example was over a long RTT path. It was, as, as we talked about earlier, that's where those extra buffers really matter. But what I wanted to do now was to test it on a low RTT path where both instances might be in the same VPC. Uh, and so you know, in this case, I had two instances. They had uh, about a 1.2 millisecond round trip time. And I just wanted to see, you know, re really, what, what was the, I, I expected that the MTU would have a pretty significant impact here. You know, how big of an impact would the MTU really have? So what I did was I actually started by just taking the defaults out of the box and putting in place a 1500 byte MTU because, you know, again, although this is not the default at this point in, in VPC, I did want to see, you know, what's the difference in the MTU setting? How does that change things? So out of the box uh, with 1500 byte MTU, it got pretty good performance already, 8.8 .8 gigabits per second um, on, a, on an instance that has a 10 gig NIC, that's, um, that's pretty good. And then if I go back to that 9,001 byte MTU, though, I see that now I do bump up. I, I do get a little bit of boost in performance by reducing the amount of overhead uh, in, my, in, in every single packet. I get my performance up to about 9.3 gigabits per second. And then I went ahead and tried, you know, how much does active queue management work um, when I'm, you know, operating in this low RTT environment in the same data center? And as it turned out, basically zero. Um, didn't, didn't actually help me very much, uh, given how, you know, these are two instances with a low RTT uh, operating in the same availability zone. Ended up active key management didn't play a, queue, a, a huge role here. But, you know, again, with, with just by having that larger MTU, ended up with about a 5% increase in performance over the, the baseline 1500 byte. So, uh, again, although the 9001 byte MTU really is the default today, um, in some cases, I, I know, uh, in some cases, customers or engineers have thought, maybe I should tune back to 1500-byte MTU since, since sort of the internet at large operates at that. And, and you know, that is, in some cases, that might be the right decision, but uh, it, it does, uh, we do end up with uh, increased performance using the larger 9001-byte uh, MTU. All right, so last, uh, last test I wanted to do. Now, for this test, I wanted to simulate something that, uh, has, simulate a web service that was transmitting a very small amount of data, where the payload was very small, the response size was very small, uh, because particularly I wanted to see what, what are the impacts of the initial congestion window, and, and would that really meaningfully change performance as I, as I tweaked that? So, you know, in the previous test, I, I did HTTPS. Um, the major, um, so you can do a lot of background reading on HTTPS, but essentially it boils down to now being a case where HTTPS does require a few round trips on initial connection establishment just to get HTTPS established. So I wanted to simulate something where there, you know, literally the entire response size could fit into the initial packets that are um, being sent from server to client. And so I couldn't do that with HTTPS. I did that with HTTP. Um, and, and interestingly enough, HTTP 2.0 seems like it will actually allow me potentially to run the same test with, with HTTP uh, with with, with uh, TLS enabled, um, but we're not quite there yet. So so I ran this with HTTP, and really and again, so my object size was 10k. I just want to transfer a 10k object as to as many parallel clients. In this case, I have 6,400 simulated parallel clients, and I just want to transfer this uh, with as low latency as possible. So again, I started with out of the box ended up seeing about 2.6 gigabits of total throughput. But really, in this case, I was focused on the mean time of 195 milliseconds you know, to, to transmit, uh, uh, to respond to my client, my, my, uh, my client, uh, simulated clients. So then I decided to go ahead and bump up the initial congestion window. Again, I wanted to see if my default con congestion window would be less than that 10K object size, but now with this this increased con initial congestion window, it will be larger. My, my initial congestion window will be larger than 10K. 
And sure enough, that actually does mean, you know, does improve performance. I, I, my bandwidth increased to 2.7 gigabits, and I shaved uh, you know, uh, five and a half milliseconds off the response time. Uh, so, you know, a win for my initial congestion window. I then decided I wanted to go ahead and turn on, I wanted to try my Illinois congestion control algorithm, see what sort of change that, that had on it. And although they ended up, it ended up reducing sort of the, the peak bandwidth we saw, it, it did actually um, reduce the, the mean time. I think we, we pulled off some of the outliers on the, on the transfer time here by turning this on. So that was a, a little bit of a win. Uh, and you know, in total, I achieved about a 4.6% decrease by, by tuning these two settings. Uh, so, you know, decreased our, our response time by 4.6%. By and if you actually look at the mean time, what's interesting uh, about this is, that, again, this was done over an 80 millisecond round trip time. So the, the mean time is, a, is sort of about two and, and a half uh, round trips, which, which is pretty good. I mean, that implies that, that uh, I'm establishing a TCP connection and transferring data and closing that with about two and a half uh, round trip times uh, on average. So pretty happy with these results. All right, so that, that was the, these were the four experiments I ran. Um, and I just want to kind of summarize all of, you know, the, the content of this talk. Um, you know, oftentimes I think, you know, I, even I can think about the networks as being a little bit of a black box. If I'm seeing a performance issue, you know, how do I really know what's going on and, and what's impacting my performance? And you know, I, I think that as I showed with some of the tools earlier, the network really doesn't have to be a black box. You can interrogate it and get the, you know, figure out exactly what's going on, figure out what timers are being used and what retransmissions are being seen and, and how that's impacting your performance. Um, I, you know, and then I think, I hope I've demonstrated that through a few simple changes to the parameters that are used with TCP, you, you can actually see meaningful improvements in performance. Uh, and really what this, you know, the way I did this was just by setting up a, some, a, a test bed, testing it, measuring my results, and then tweaking one parameter at a time and seeing, you know, how my performance uh, changed over time. So I strongly encourage you, you know, if you're, if you're worried about network performance, you know, understand what is your workload, how does it use the network, and, uh, you know, tune your network uh, stack accordingly. So please complete the evaluations for this course. Uh, they help us uh, improve the content and keep it uh, high quality at reInvent. And uh, really appreciate you coming to the talk. So thank you.